Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 116, Non-Game Gifts for Gamers. When you can't buy games for the gamer that has them all, what do you get? I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. We record live every Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, tonight we've got someone doing their holiday gift shopping for a gamer, and they don't want to just buy them more games. So we've got some great ideas for them. In the game room, we've got reviews of a couple of independently published filler games, one a kid's game, and one great for gamers of all ages. Finally, on the Bellhop's tabletop, we're playing one of Sean's favorite games with the whole family down here in Windsor. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, Dwayne Wallstrom has a two-player game suggestion. They wrote, Star Realms. Fantastic mm -hmm. card game. Highly recommended. All right, so this uh, comment came from our best modern two-player games episode. And I have to agree, Star Realms is a fantastic game. One that's actually stood the test of time and which I still enjoy playing. But as I just said, the test of time, because this one's a little too old for our criteria for this episode. Despite feeling like a brand new game, Star Realms to me still feels pretty fresh. This is six years old at this point. While I do love Star Realms, I really only get to play it on the Steam app. So it's pretty solo for me. Yeah. Now, sticking with deck building, we got a couple of comments on our Tyrants of the Underdark <laughs> review last week. First off, Chance French says, Great game, my favorite deck builder by far. And Chris Groff commented, I quite enjoy this game. I think the presentation, theme, and price point held it back from having a broader appeal, though. Thanks for the comments, Chance and Chris. Um, I gotta say, I'm glad it's not just me who's turned off by the presentation of Tyrants. A lot of the times when I'm complaining about it, I have people say, oh, it's not that bad, or I actually like the board, or whatever. I, I'm glad to see Chris agrees that the presentation there is lacking. I, overall, I do wish that game did better, but I think Chris is right. There's reasons it didn't. I, I just, if it had kept going, there are so many things they could have done with that. Like, they only put out two more half decks. They could have put out tons of them. Plus, they could have just went on, right? It's D&D. &D. They could have added an overworld expansion and a goblins invade expansion and who knows i would have loved to have seen that game expand further all right well next a comment from ak gamer girl who on twitch who comment on one of our jaws of the lion actual plays she writes thank you for your video my husband and i are learning gloomhaven through jaws of the lion and we're not sure how to designate the health on objectives <laughs> thanks again well, you're very welcome, AK Gamer Girl. Uh, I'm always glad to read these comments where we pointed out something that someone missed or helped someone enjoy a game more than what they would have if they hadn't seen the video. I'd love to hear it. Thank you for the comment. All right. Well, last week we noted we were tweaking the format for the show. Yesterday, not long after the show went live, we got some feedback from one of the people who had given us feedback. They wrote to say, hats off, Mo. I love the new format. Nice flow, tight conversation, and super informative. Again, you really know your stuff, and I can really appreciate what you bring to the table. I'm a gamer since the mid-80s, and I can tell by the way you talk about games that you're passionate. Also, thanks for all the deal finding during the holidays. That's great to hear. I, I gotta say it's so awesome. I don't think we've ever gotten feedback that quickly. If we, we always beg for it. We're like, please let us know. And this was great to hear that this quickly after just one show. And I'm happy to hear so far people seem to like what we've done, the changes we've made. I did think it was going to be an improvement. And I think we did a good job to um, tighten things down. But I didn't know how fans would take it. So anytime we change anything, you worry that by making one person happy, you upset someone else. And, of course, you're welcome for the deals, too. Thank you for using our links during the holidays. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Thanks to everyone who stops by and catches us live in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. 
All right, so tonight's main topic is going to be gifts for gamers that aren't games, because you never, in general, I don't recommend buying gamers more games, because they tend to have very specific preferences, plus you never know what they have, and what they already have on their wish list, and what other games people are going to buy people. So what we're going to be doing is we are going to be checking in with the lobby after our main topic, after Sean and I have discussed it, to see if anyone there comes up with something we didn't think of. Because this is a pretty broad category, and I have a feeling there's going to be some great ideas out there that we'll probably not come up with on our own. Are we good on the other issue that Jeff brought up? We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Today's question comes from Chris S., who asked, With the holidays coming up, what does one get for the gamer that has everything? I have a friend who is the game buyer for our group, mm -hmm. so he doesn't need games, but it would be great to get them some accessories for the games they have. What do you recommend? Well, thanks for the great topic, Chris. Um, I just hope this one doesn't get out too late for people who, uh, for people and they haven't already finished their holiday shopping. So really this advice should be evergreen. So even if we're past the, the um, actual Christmas season, there's always birthdays, other occasions, and we'll have the holidays again next year. Absolutely. So uh, what the thing, um, about buying gifts for gamers is I already have like someone talking about the game buyer and the game buyer has all the games so he doesn't need more games and i think this is true for buying games for gamers at any point in time it's always hard to buy more games you never know exactly what the person's tastes are going to be and you're not sure uh, what games they own already or what games other people may have bought for them i always find it safer to not buy specifically games or new games for a gamer Unless they hand you a specific wish list, like, hey, here's my Amazon wish list, go shopping. That's completely different because then you know you're getting them something they want. And while using the Amazon wish list, if you buy it, it drops off the list so no one else will see it. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's it's always especially dangerous at the holidays uh, if you're not using wish lists because you never know what, you know, Aunt yeah. May or Uncle Ted are going to have bought you. and. Yep. While odds are good that they aren't going to have gotten you, you know, the next hottest uh, hobby role playing or hobby game, you never know. They could, you could have some cool that's aunts true. and uncles out there who are uh, got their thumb on the pulse of BGG. Yeah, that's exactly it, right? I actually have some relatives now who will go on Board Game Geek and look at the top 100 list. Little do they know, I own like 80 of them. So again, their odds are pretty slim that they're going to find something I don't have. And if I don't have it, there's probably a reason. That's the other thing too, is even when you're shopping for someone, there's often a lot of reasons, besides reasons we buy games, there's a lot of reasons we don't buy games. And there may be a reason we haven't picked up a specific game. Um all right, so looking at some specific non-game gifts for the gamer in your life, um, one of the first things I thought of when I saw this question was back in August 2018, we had one of our, our more popular episodes was whether or not box inserts are worth it. And if it's worth investing on getting various organizers for your board games. And our end result after our discussion at least in my opinion, was that if there's anything you can do that will get a game to the table more often that or get a game to the table that otherwise wouldn't get played at all, then it's worth it. So one of my strongest recommendations are box inserts or some form of inbox organization for um, the, the, the person's favorite games. I'm assuming if you game with this person, you know what their favorite games are, that you play with them enough, what are the games they break out all the time, or what's the game, even better, that they say, oh, I want to play that, but you know what, it takes too long to set up, or oh, I want to play that, but it takes so long to put away. Those are the ones you want to get box inserts for. And if you play with them all the time, you may know perfectly well which is the game that takes yeah. too long. There, there is a little bit of self-serving in this one as mm -hmm. well, because you're going to get to play the game more often, or you're going to get to do yes. less work putting out or or putting away yes. the game so this 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 one benefits everyone not just the game owner there you go yeah it's, it's also a not so subtle hint to just buy it for the game you always want to play and they don't <laughs> that, that might be another way to point it out so in um now that we're nearing the end of 2020 there are a lot of options for box inserts back when we first covered this only two years ago there were like three main companies that did this and they're still around, but there are so many more choices right now. Um, one of the cheapest alternatives, if you're trying to stick to um, lower cost is folded space. They do foam inserts and the bonus of a foam insert is it's light. 
because that is your disadvantage to buying a big wooden insert is it greatly increases the weight of the game. Another huge option nowadays is going on Etsy. Pretty much if you search any game and insert, you'll find something and it'll be a combination. You're going to be able to find um, uh, foam core. You're going to be able to find plastic. You're going to be able to find wood and you're going to be able to find 3D printed. The other thing, while you won't find this on Etsy, is just search for STL files. Is, doesn't everyone now have at least one friend with a 3D printer at this point? And if you don't, supposedly the local libraries have them. I haven't tried it myself. I do know at least five people in Windsor with 3D printers now. So get the STL file and get them to print it up for you. Just make sure it's not your friend who's doing the printing because they may figure out the gift a little bit ahead of time. <laughs> um, regarding foam core, you can find patterns for various foam core inserts for, pre again, pretty much every game on Board Game Geek. Um, there are game trays. They make molded plastic inserts, though those tend to be specific for specific games. Um, Meeple Realty, Broken Token are the two big names as far as wooden inserts are concerned. Uh, newer one to that uh, company is Eraptor, which does their, their inserts are flashier, we'll say, than Meeple Realty or Broken Token. They, they tend to theme them. They have extra artwork. You can even buy stained wood, but of course you pay for that added look. So they make kind of higher end ones. Um, another uh, alternative fold folded space now is Insert Here, which is another company that does foam inserts. There are just a ton of them nowadays. Like basically find that game, Google game box insert, you'll find all kinds of options. Now, one thing to think about is if you are buying a wood insert, while they are nice, they, A, as you mentioned already, they add weight, mm -hmm. but they are also uh, time consuming and, and require effort to build so mm -hmm. if that if your gamer if, if, if your gamer friend isn't really that sort of handy person who's going to be want to you know working with a rubber mallet and glue and and assembling this thing because it, it mm -hmm. requires assembly um you might want to hold off or go with one of the other options again the foam ones while they require assembly are generally easier to assemble yeah. than the wooden ones if not as sturdy if you really want to give a good gift give it to them assembled and then you've done all the work for them. Though if they like modeling, then you're going to yep. want to give it to them. So it, it really depends on the person. I do know a number of people out there that would love fully assembled box inserts because they don't want to spend the time themselves. There are some major uh, hosts of shows out there yes. who, who hate <laughs> the idea of assembling them. Yes, yes. There are, there, there are a couple podcasts out there that happily pay their fans to assemble inserts for them. They actually buy them online, get them shipped to the fans, and then the fans ship them to them, and they pay them to, to assemble them, which is pretty cool. All right, next, the, the next thing I thought of. So so first thing I thought is organize their games, right? Get those games to the table more. Get something so they can clean it up and they can get it out quicker. Um, the best inserts, of course, also help enhance play in some way um, by you know making things organized on the table. Next, I have component upgrades. This is extremely generic. Like this covers a huge, wide range of things. Uh, the first thing I think of is there's a company out there called Meeple. No, not Meeple Realty. Meeple Realty is the other company. Meeple Source. Sorry, I, I didn't put it in the notes. Meeple Source is the company which I first discovered at Origins, and what they make is custom Meeple. Now, when they launched, they were literally Meeple. Like they were they they repainted Carcassonne Meeples, really. Now they've gotten huge into all kinds of upgrade components from, um, again, custom meeple, uh, different types of player pawns, upgraded components. So instead of wooden chits, or sorry, instead of cardboard chits, you have wooden things. I own stuff from them. Like one of the examples is I own the corn for Zolkin, which actually looks so much cooler than the little wooden tokens. And I have little corn and big corn. I bought the fish replacements for um, fleet. So instead of having little blue cubes when you're fishing, you have little blue fish on your thing. And there are a huge number of different things. Now, they're not the only company doing it. It's just it's one of the big names. They kind of did it first. Uh, the other thing I've been finding a lot of nowadays, again, Etsy is a great source for this, is 3D printed components. And stuff you wouldn't think of. So one of the highlights here that I can think of is two particular ones. One is an upgrade for Imhotep, which is a game we've talked about many, many times on the show. And there are a couple different people out there who are making 3D components where like the boats are 3D, like you expect that. You're like, all right, 3D boats. So yeah, it replaces the cardboard token, but they also have things that go around the monuments. So there's like a, a scaffolding that goes around the, the one thing and other various cool 3D printed stuff that makes the game look more Egyptian themed instead of just a bunch of cubes. Interesting. 
Um, the other one is Everdell. Everdell is a very popular game that has a big tree that's a center place for it. Well, they have people have been making component holders that look like half shells of nuts to sit with the theme of it, and they just look so great. And I'm like, oh, that looks fantastic. Nice. Now, the other thing you can do too is um, a replacement components for um, like resources. Um, this could be any type of there's clay out there, there's resin, there's again 3D printed, there's wooden versions. Uh, Stonemeyer Games offers various packs for all their games so if you play scythe you can get a scythe upgrade kit if you play um wingspan i actually wingspan i think has an upgrade kit but they stonemeyer produces sets specific for their different games plus they sell generic upgrades that can be used with any game so that's a good one to replace like um your gold bars with actual gold pieces of metal they're not actual gold but like they're painted gold and so on um another upgrade is get rid of that paper money if you're buying for a gamer and they own Power Grid, get them a set of poker chips or metal coins or something to replace that paper money. Um, metal coins can often be bought for specific games. Again, Stonemeyer produces metal coins specifically for side, but there are enough generic ones out there. Another useful one is poker chips. Now, of course, the, the industry standard now for hobby board gaming would be the Iron Clays from Roxley. But you could just get standard poker chips. The, 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 the iron clays have the advantage of not having spades, hearts, diamonds, and clubs on them and looking like a casino chip. So I do like those better. Similar to poker chips, for those of you who play Savage Worlds or um, Hero Clicks, you can get custom bennies. So those are things you give out during the game or fate tokens for people who play fate games. Or um, another example is an initiative card set for any RPG that uses popcorn initiative. And all these are is a set of cards that say that you've gone or not. So if you've gone, you flip it over. And if you haven't gone, you flip it back. And then you have a bunch for the NPCs. There are companies that make sets where you could get your own printed. Absolutely. Now, the, yep. now, a big source for this that came out of nowhere in the last few years is board game geek themselves they have this whole thing they now call the geek up store and while there is some amazing looking stuff there i haven't tried any of this because their shipping to canada is terrible but if you can get them at a con which i realize that's ironic to say at the end of 2020 but if you can find them at a con you can get this stuff plus i think the shipping to the states is better uh what they do is they make plastic replacement components for pretty much the cardboard chits in most games. Like the first one I saw was the Orléans geek up set, which replaces all of the wooden discs with like plastic, almost, almost poker like chip, like, but smaller, um, discs that you'd pull from the bag and they're like plastic and they clack and like, they just feel so much better. One of the very popular ones they have, the most popular one on their site for a long time was for quacks of Quedlinburg which is a game where you have a cauldron in front of you and you're pulling out various regions out of the cauldron trying to make sets. And they're cardboard pieces that you're feeling in. Well, they've replaced them all with plastic. So again, you reach into the bag, you feel all the plastic components and you peel them up. There are tons and tons of these geek up components. Again, they're a little pricier, but like it's the people at Board Game Geek, right? They take it very seriously. And they make sure that they, if they're components that should be upgraded, that need to be upgraded, instead of just upgrading for the sake of upgrading, like it, it's, they're definite improvements. You can pretty much replace the cardboard in most of the popular games. Absolutely. There's, uh, there's some fantastic stuff out there. And I, if you're, depending on which game you're into, they really uh, sort of branches out, you know, for Catan, there are a billion options oh, yeah. for how and what you might want to upgrade. Uh, Terraforming Mars has got a pretty wide range oh, yeah. of components you can upgrade. Uh, so any game that has a table presence at all is going to have, depending on its popularity, various levels mm -hmm. of upgradability out there uh, from you know your various buyers like Etsy and BGG. All right, the next one I got noted here is neoprene mats this is something i would have never recommended say even five years ago i'm thinking like it's it's been in a little last little while um rising sun then when i got that kickstarter copy that was one of the ones that convinced me i have now fallen in love with gaming on a neoprene mat consider picking up a mat for your gamer's favorite game there are tons out there either official or not um, if you can try to make sure they didn't steal any artwork, that is a bit of an issue with some of these mats, but 
almost any game that can use a neoprene mat that has some form of player board, there's one out there from somewhere. Someone's created it. Like there's one of the ones that's on my wish list personally is there is a two player Azul mat that does the central marketplace and both player boards that you can just roll up. And I'm like, oh, we talk about playing that at a bar. That'd be so perfect to roll it on a bar. Plus neoprene is nice and easy to clean. <laughs> I've seen mats for almost every popular game. Um, the other thing is if you can't find a mat for the specific game, generic mats are also a good option for most gamers. Now you can get all kinds of ones. You can get a like a star map for sci-fi games if you do i do suggest getting at least three by three because that way it's perfect for x-wing and legion and all of those star wars games and miniature games um the other thing i would consider is like a water pattern that's great if you're a big Catan fan so you've got your lake around your island but it's also good if you're doing any like naval battle games you can get just a, a green mat for a generic field or just a plain bat black mat like even if it's just plain black giant mouse pad it's going to be great for keeping components in place and making things easier to pick up, which for me is huge. Anyone who's gamed with me laughs at my lack of ability to pick up things off tables. And having something there helps so much. Uh, also, if you are a fan of chunkier dice or especially metal mm. dice, yes. you want to have some sort of protection for whatever surface you're rolling on. Yes. Um, and uh, we'll get to some other options for that, but a neoprene mat is a fantastic one for that. One thing you're going to want to pay attention to is the thickness of the mat. Uh, just be aware that the thicker the neoprene, while it's going to cost a little bit more, it's also significantly higher mm -hmm. quality. So your five millimeter mats are going to be much better than a one or two millimeter, yep. uh, you know, cheap little uh, mouse pad and have a, uh, a better durability. The other thing that I've seen, and I don't know a lot about it, and this was a big deal with the uh, Rising Sun mat, is the edging what they've done to protect the edges. Yeah. So I know that's a stitched edge, which is supposedly better protected. So that's another thing to watch for when you're looking at neoprene Yeah, because you could either get a stitch, stitched edge or they could even do a ceiling, which is basically yeah. like a heat press. Uh, and that will, over time, give way, essentially, yeah. more than a stitched edge will likely. Now, one of the big sources for this now is Game Toppers, which is a company that makes tabletops that you put on top of your like dining room table to turn into a game table. Well, all of those have a recessed play area. And while they now have, they, they started off by making mats for their tables, but people like the mats so much that you can just buy those. So Game Toppers is actually now a great source for those at various sizes. So that's one of those. If you want to get something big enough to cover your whole table, you probably could. And I guess I didn't put it on this list officially, but Game Toppers, if you have a lot of money and really like your gamer friend, I guess you could get them a Game Topper. Though I would recommend if you're going to do that, get your group, right? If you've got an RPG group or a game group that gets together every every Saturday, maybe you can pull your money and could get, get something that big. But jumping back to neoprene mats, I also wanted to mention for RPG fans, this would be a really cool one. If you're playing in an established world, especially you're playing in D&D, &D, right? And you're playing in the Forgotten Realms or you're on Athos or you're in um, whatever, the Sword Coast, you can often get mats showing the maps from various D&D adventures, like an overland map of the DM's campaign world of choice. I think it'd be a really cool kind of over-the-top gift that I, I don't think anyone would expect. Absolutely. Uh, and oddly enough, I actually sort of just out of, as I was Googling something about neoprene mats, found that there are some uh, tabletop uh, miniature battle mats that are 15 millimeters thick. Wow. That's really thick. So <laughs> apparently some of the miniature games really like super thick. I, I assume they can't be too compressive. They can't be too squishy. But uh, yeah, yeah, 15 I don't know. millimeter thick neoprene mats are available with uh, various maps for... Uh, Cool. Uh, looks like more like um, historical battles. Then talking about RPG maps, the other thing that has become hugely popular recently are cloth maps. This, I noticed, started with a bunch of Kickstarters and Kickstarter stretch goals. There were a whole bunch of these mega dungeons and huge adventures that all of a sudden would come up with this cloth wall map that you could get. And I got to say, that just seems like a really cool gift. Something that, again, would be out of the blue, right? Like, if we've been adventuring in the Forgotten Realms for a year and a half, and then you show up with this map I can put up on the wall of the game room, I just think that'd be really cool. Or that I can throw it on the table and put some pawns on to show where we are on the map or something like that. 
like I could even see someone, you know, if you've, if you've got some Grognard fans, you can get a map of the Tomb of Horrors printed up on, you know, a four by six cloth map. That Grognard's going to be pretty happy. Absolutely. There's there's fantastic options out there of uh, of whatever you want. Just again, try not to try to make sure that you're getting something official and not yes. uh, just grabbing and grabbing art off the web. And if you're just looking for dungeon maps, head over to Dyson Logos' website. He has a whole bunch of free-to-use maps. If you're just looking for that aesthetic, the old-school hatch style. Absolutely. All right, moving over to something useful for any game that has dice. I've got these kind of grouped together, but dice towers and dice trays. If you play any RPG or war game or board game with dice, think about picking up a dice tower or dice tray. Now, I'm not going to get into specifics here, and we actually have a question from one of our fans asking us to rate different types. The problem is I don't have the the resources to go pick up a bunch of different ones, but there are a lot of options out there from very basic drop it in the top with one little thing in the middle that kind of makes it fall all over to like giant clockwork Rube Goldberg-like towers that can stack on top of each other. Um, Broken Token, who we mentioned above in the... um, or earlier in the talking about box inserts has a series of these dice towers that are like a Rube Goldberg machine where you can stack them in any number and make like a huge thing. And I'm like, that's really cool, but I can see using it once. Like, yeah, I don't want to wait for my, wait that long for my, exactly. my results. I'm, I'm like, they are cool, but I just, 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 you know, I, I don't know, maybe for, for some kind of competition or something, like have it at extra life, and if your diet, whatever your dice come out, you get to win something, but not while I'm just trying to play a game. And then dice trays. There are so many out there. Um, I'm going to give props to Easy Roller Dice here because we have one of their trays that I actually really like. It's a hexagonal tray that has a staging area, so you can put the dice you're not rolling on the outside, a rolling area inside. Plus, the up- opposite side of the lid is also a rolling tray. Those, again, are very useful, as Sean mentioned, for um, metal dice, right? If you're going to use metal dice, you need something to have uh, to protect your table. Absolutely. There's so many different options from, from you know, uh, artisan-crafted wood dice trays to uh, flat, lay flat leather uh, ones that you can that snap together into a, into a tray yep. for easy portability. There's so many out there. And also, if you're getting dice, if the, if, if the gamer you're buying for likes dice and, and, and uses games with dice, there are also some great dice options out there yep. you can buy. Because one, even if they have a D6, they will want more. There is no real gamer out there that doesn't want more dice. Plus, if you want to, they won't complain if you just get them some fun dice. Mm-hmm. Uh, find a set of weather dice or smiley face dice. There are always ways that if you get someone dice, they'll find a way to use them in a game. Yep. So go ahead, buy something pretty as well. Yeah, and if you want something high end, another thing that's uh, that's becoming more and more accessible and easier to find, and the prices are going down because of this, are gemstone dice. Dice made of actual gemstones. Now, fair warning, you probably do not want to use them. And if you do use them, you want to use a dice tray. And second, you only want to roll one at a time because when they bang into each other, they will chip. This is, I've been told from the horse's mouth many times that I should stop recommending gemstone dice because they are so fragile. Um, But if you want something that looks great on the shelf, there, there are some fantastic options out there. And Jeff, Jeff in our chat room says, impossible to have too many dice. So yes, right many there, people there's think the so. people out there who, who oh, yeah. will not complain if more dice show up in the stocking. Here, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up for another one that's off script here, not even on my list, because of an awesome Facebook post I shot shared where someone had bought spice jars, and they were rounded at the bottom, and they made those their dice control holders. So all their different colored dice were put on the spice holder and it looked like potion bottles and it was wood and it was fantastic. Right. So if you do know a gamer with a ton of dice, maybe some way to display and show off those dice. Because they probably have them in a little, you know, Crown Royal the bag. Crown Royal bag. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, moving away from dice. Um, but similar to dice towers and trays, I want to talk about component organizers. Now this is for organizing components at the table while you're playing. This isn't 
stashed away packing your game away this is for organizing all the various piles of resources keeping your gold separate from your wood separate from your wheat or whatever your game happens to be using now every time we talk about this i always show off the wooden bowls i have they are my favorite to this day but i know they're not easy to find i like these low shallow technically they're salad bowls they're wooden they're really good for that but there are another uh, other options um, from silicon muffin cups is probably the cheapest one you'll find, which is literally just silicon muffin cups. And what's great about those is you can toss them in your board game box and they can get squished flat and nothing will happen to them. Um, flat rubber squares. I don't know what you call these, but they're like flat with snaps in the corners and you snap them together and they become component bowls. I, I don't know what else they're called. Um, I've also seen leather versions of those, but the rubber ones are really, again, really affordable and cheap. Um, and then what I've seen more of, and I would love, this is th these are the ones that I'm tempted by, are actual component cups. And there's a couple different companies putting these out. And they're the standard square bowl, but what they have is a spout on one end. So when you're trying to dump the components back into either your organizer or your Ziploc baggie, it's a lot easier than trying to shove stuff out. Yep. And uh, Jeff in the chat room was mentioning earlier, he would be happy with just a box of the small cell phone sized manila envelopes uh, as a way to uh, sort out and organize your cards for right. things or a box of tiny baggies, right? Uh, it's the, I, I, if you give someone a baggies. gift, a box of tiny baggies, they may get the wrong idea. In in your, in the stock, that, that's more of a stocking stuffer than, than you know, yeah, you yeah, have a nicely wrapped box of, of Ziploc, but uh, yeah. But again, that's, you know, a, that's an odd these choice. Are, I, these I are think things it's, you need, right? You can it, never true. have too many Ziploc bags as a gamer. Yeah, true enough. True enough. Now, if you can get custom colored Ziploc bags, those are the really nice ones. The company I got mine from no longer around, unfortunately. And yes, I know some people out there think they're ridiculous, but I loved my custom colored Ziploc bags because I could split up the components by player color or based on what they were for. Like I totally redid my version of uh, Castles of Burgundy so that I had a different colored bag for all the different chits you'd pull out and the color matched the chit color. Though I know some people think that colored Ziploc bags are ridiculous. It was sitting right behind you. Yes. Um. <laughs> All right. Next one. Here's one uh, that I actually didn't think of when I first created the list, but I went back and added it on after the fact this morning is gamer luggage. In particular, um, I, I spotted my Quiver card carrying case and I was like, oh, that is a great gift. Um, Quiver Time makes a number of different products for holding, uh, specifically they're designed for like magic players or card game players, but I have mine holding all kinds of different card based games. For example, all my cards for Agricola are in my Quiver. Um, but I also have uh, my copy of Start Player. I've got Star Realms in there. I've got all kinds of stuff. Now, for those of you who play competitive deck games, they have something called the Citadel Deck Box, which is the most solid piece of protecting your deck you're going to find like you could probably throw this and get it run over by a car and it'd be fine for bigger games i will recommend multiple times a cajun or cajun i'm not even sure how it's pronounced it's a type of drum it's a k a c sorry c a j o n look for a cajun bag which i i think it's cajon bag um these it's it's a it's a drum you sit on and you kind of drum with it but the size of the bag is perfect for that ticket to ride style box and that is pretty close to the industry standard nowadays and you can fit between six and ten games in one of these things um at more expense now these only cost like 20 30 bucks what you can also find are nowadays board game backpacks or gamer backpacks there are a number of companies putting these out um I can't think of any of the off the top of my hand, any of the brands, but well, there are a number board, of board game tables.com has, uh, has a great selection of them. Yeah. Um, of, of, of you know, I guess they're just standard size. You can, you can carry them like a duffel. You can strap them on your back. Uh, there's a bunch of different options out there from yeah. the insane to the, uh, Oh yeah. They the go all reasonable. Over. Uh, you can, they're, they're all levels are out there. Yep. And then for the role players, there are a number of basically D and D backpacks nowadays are out there where they've got specific straps for holding your rolled up maps and your map dudes, and they've got a spot to put your rule books and a spot to put your laptop and and spot to hold your dice and your pencils and stuff like that. There are a ton of these out here. 
Now, for miniature gamers, uh, we actually talked all about how to transport miniatures back in episode 92, a small problem. Uh, we talked about Battle Flown, specifically that company, uh, just Stanley tool cases, like for tool and bits organization, and various pluck foam options. So that's worth checking out. Um, for anyone who likes card games or small box games, especially party games, things that are in like that, that code names, just one, the crew, um, uh, Fox in the Forest, Fox in the Forest duet, those small box games that don't have a lot in them, I strongly recommend checking out a photo case. These are the kinds that comes in a large plastic clamshell case with a bunch of smaller cases inside. This one, I actually got this tip from Danielle. Uh, one of our, our fans who actually happens to be in our chat room right now. Uh, they have a couple of these. Her and Owen, her husband, were like carrying, I don't know how many it is, but it was like 50 games in the back of their car. We showed up to a game night and they just pulled out this like two cases and they're like, yep, I got 50 games with me. And I'm like, that is fantastic if you travel and play your games. Especially, like I said, those smaller box games. But you can like, these are big enough you can flip Splendor as well because wonder really for the size of the box doesn't have a lot in it but it's great for these card games yep and uh, also depending on how you're carrying games if you're if you're willing to carry them a little more loosely uh you can also get uh spe game game bands or ba bands to hold your games closed so you yep. don't have to worry about things popping open in the tray if you've got you know games in, in your trunk uh you know a lot of times you'll get uh, they'll actually be the the Double double strap uh, uh, bands, specifically mm -hmm. sized for board games. Yeah, board uh, game bands are a thing. I've never bought them, but I tend to play here to or somewhere them, else. Well, and so. you pack them pretty tight in milk crates. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd recommend milk crates if you. But those technically you can't buy anymore. Yeah. Well, you were never supposed to use them in the first place. Yeah, you weren't. You weren't supposed <laughs> to keep those. You're not supposed to have them. All right, I'm a little off at 50 games. So Danielle is telling 16 or 18 games per case, but still, let's let's wear 32 games or 36 games in in in, in like a, in your hands, right? That's fantastic. Here's a little one where you're, you're we're going a little out there. Um, for a card game player, you can online nowadays very easily get custom sleeves where you could go get whatever their favorite artwork, right? So if, if uh, whatever your, your, your friend Han Solo's favorite artist is Frank Frazetta, you could get the Death Dealer on a bunch of car, uh, a bunch of card sleeves. Or even cooler, get something that's like keyed to the specific games they like or the specific player, right? Get, get their face on the card, give them a thumbs up. Um, the other thing you can do too is most players now use play mats which kind of overlaps with our neoprene mat thing, but card game play mats are the same thing, but different. Um, so some type of custom play mat for with whatever. The, if they play magic, you get some of the latest Akora artwork with Godzilla on it because Godzilla is now a magic card or uh, <laughs> some other, if they play Star Realms, you get them the Star Realm mat that has a spot to put all the, the market deck on. The other thing, too, are deck boxes. Uh, again, this kind of goes with the quiver, but you can get all kinds of different types of deck boxes. You can get them in different size shapes, and you can get them custom made with custom artwork on them. A lot of more print shops are having things like this available nowadays. Yeah, no, absolutely. They're, they're card card uh, accessories have become yes. a major market. Um, and and from from the quiver all the way down to uh you know the boxes the sleeves uh mm -hmm. special display cases maybe you've got yep. you know that black lotus magic card that you'll never be able to play with again but <laughs> you're still proud of you can you can get uh you know custom uh, art frames for cards so all right again thinking of the custom printing thing in particular other gamer swag uh, this is a huge category, but I kind of lumped it all together because it's all the kind of thing where you go to some website, you upload an image or you pick from what they already exist and you buy it and get it shipped to the person's house or shipped to you. You got mugs, cups, T-shirts. Um, you can get a mug of your favorite gaming podcast or their favorite live stream. If you're a critter, there's all kinds of critical hits. Is that the name of the critical show? Role. Critical Role. I'm like, that's <laughs> not right. I knew I was off. I'm like, that didn't sound right. Uh, you could get something featuring your favorite game or your favorite game designers. There are a number of legit and non-legit t-shirt companies out there with some great gaming themed 
uh, shirts, I do suggest you do a little research on who you're buying from to make sure they're not stealing the artwork. Um, one of the ones I will recommend straight up is Play RPG and Co. Uh, that's Brian Weiss, who designed our awesome Bellhop logo. Does a ton of different shirts. I was hoping to wear one tonight, but I couldn't find it. Um, I've got a couple shirts that are really cool with a beholder on it and a skull on it. And he's done a bunch of RPG classes and all original artwork. So you don't have to worry about someone or, stealing. Or if you're a fan of, you know, board game arena, you can yep. get uh, swag from, from the, uh, your favorite websites. <laughs> if the person you're buying for is a fan of board game arena. <laughs> We are shopping for other people. <laughs> Just again, please don't steal images and print your own. Uh, make sure you're using legit sources. Uh, most companies have some form of swag you can get already, including us. And, and when we're talking about that, uh, when you're looking for art, go out and reach out to artists. Yeah. Um, recently on Twitter, someone got a gift for someone uh, who was a huge fan of a certain board game that had a, a bunch of great art for it. And so what they did is they reached out to the artist on that game. Most of these artists are all available on Twitter or, or your favorite social network. And they said, look, my friend's a fan of this game. Mm -hmm. You know, can we get something? And they got a piece of original art from the game as a print from oh, the artist awesome. in order to, uh, you know, frame and hang in their room. So the, that those options are out there. And now again, yeah. we're running a little late probably this year for that sort of thing, but yeah, uh, it's those a little options specific. are out there. Um, you know, or even just if they've already got something that they haven't put up, you know, getting someone a frame so that they can frame the art that they've had, you know, yeah. leaning on a shelf for for years isn't a bad thing either. Yeah, and, and also like if you go on Etsy, if you're just looking for like cool D and D style artwork, or you're looking for a picture of an orc or whatever it happens to be, that's worth doing. Um, I have personally reached out to an artist and got um, them to draw a picture of my dad's character in an MMO he used to play, and that was a very unique gift. And not only did I get the picture so I could frame it, I got it put on some drinking stein because my dad and I like to drink beer together. So we yeah. had he has his own drinking stein with theirs his character on it that he got to level 85 on his own um so that was a really cool one so character art again my dad's happened to be an mmo but you uh, can also get yeah. artwork done commissioned artwork done for your rpg group like if you want the game master give a gift to your game master get your characters all drawn up yeah and i had uh i actually i've reached out to people on uh, deviant art before and it's like hey look yep. you've got this fantastic art i would love to get a copy of this and i'm going to do this mm -hmm. with it uh, and on DeviantArt and places like that, oftentimes they'll just say, yeah, sure, here's the origi here's an original yeah, here size copy, you know, <laughs> and, and just go ahead and do it. Uh, or, you know, maybe they'll ask you for, for something, or maybe they even already have it set up through DeviantArt to, mm -hmm. to be able to purchase stuff. But unless you ask, you'll never know. And then similar to that, this one goes to RPGs. Just thinking back from I ran a multiple year spanning AD&D campaign, and people bought stuff for that game often. We had uh, the, the group together had a couple iconic um, things in their heraldry, one being griffins, the other being this uh, gauntlet, this obsidian fist. And by the end of our campaign, we had stamps. We had stampers with griffins on them. We had um, one of my friends had actually picked up a banner at a Renaissance Fest. So we actually had a pennant that they would bring to game night. Any of that stuff that's means only something to your group right something that personal so your group of characters together are the adventurers incorporated and they have a logo or whatever you can get that logo printed again swag on mugs t-shirts whatever but you can even go further and get it themed like get tabards made or something for your for your group or get your your dm uh the 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 dungeon master hat or whatever something of that type that's specific to your group absolutely all right, I got a couple of ones here that are a little outside the box. Um, other media tied to a gaming license. So this is, again, it's broad. But what made me think of it is the fact that board games and RPGs are getting more and more popular and more and more mass market. And there's getting a lot more crossover. So there's always been like the TSR novels to go with the D&D &D settings. But like there are things like Gloomhaven has a comic strip that was supposed to be coming out in December called Fallen Lion, which is going to tell the story be before Jaws of the Lion. Now, that's not going to hit shelves until December 30th, so it won't work for this year's holidays. But, like, back in the day, I used to buy Pathfinder comic books. And in the back of 
the Pathfinder comic book, there was actually a short adventure and a dungeon map tile, which I thought was awesome. And I actually, the, the comic was better than I thought. I was buying it for the cool dungeon tile and the adventure. Uh, another example is the Android Netrunner series of games from Fantasy Flight Games spawned a big enough universe that there are novels. You can buy Android Netrunner novels. Older series, again, all the TSR ones have novels. Battletech, the Battletech novels have been around for a long time. There are a growing number of this other media that's tied to games. I even own a Paranoia novel. So if there's a particular game someone's into, take a look around. You might be able to find something tied to that license that isn't a game specifically. Absolutely. Uh, and then moving on from that, once you've, uh, you know, got uh, media tied to a license you can actually go to digital licenses so yes. uh you can get uh you know steam is an easy place to to gift things although i have noticed recently that there are some problems gifting people across some country borders on steam really so so be aware of that depending on what country and what currency you're working in there could be some weirdness but uh you know it's there are always sales or you know things for tabletop uh, simulator or specific games there's a you know the the number of board games available on mm. steam is remarkable can uh, you buy um I, I don't have one nintendo switch games for other people i i know I the no switch idea. the switch is huge for board games like every like you got your ticket to ride your Catans, your cark but like everything's starting to come out on switch now i don't know if that's something if you can I, I have to assume you can buy a download code somewhere. Well, at the very least, you can get gift cards for, for right. Switch, I'm sure. So um, other options are, you know, a membership to BGA. Uh, you can gift yep. uh, gift those or uh, Tabletop Audio or Sirenscape, as we've talked about on the show, yep. for your RPG players. Or even non-RPG. We oh. were using Sirenscape for Gloomhaven for a while there. Uh, and I, and I, would ass I wonder, can you do uh, our Roll20 memberships or, or anything? On the I would assume so, right? Like any any of those subscription-based online gaming services, especially this year um, and leading into next year in the time of COVID. Like if, if your group doesn't own Tabletop Simulator that, buy like a four-pack of Tabletop Simulators and then at least your group can get together after the holidays in January and play some games together again. Yeah until things clear up right uh and, and again as sean mentioned specific games if you all like playing terraforming mars get a terraforming mars license so switch yes you can buy codes for many games and send those you can't directly gift through the store okay but you could get the code and then give someone the code right okay but like i say i know I, I don't own a switch but i i know it's exploded for being able to play board games especially this year excellent all right, well, that's it for our discussion on non-game gifts for gamers. Let's head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has anything to add. So I see uh, just a minute ago, Anshi Games mentioned a gift card that says, I've commissioned so-and-so to draw your character portrait would be a great way yeah. to, to give that gift when really they probably need a little bit of input and and doing it would give it away if you started asking them yeah, yeah. questions about what their character looked like that's true that's true I, it depends how well you know your, your group right that's the whole thing uh earlier on danielle was mentioning uh it was sorry i was scrolling uh so I'm seeing lots looking. of fans of the muffin cups yeah so everyone, everyone muffin cups is a big one muffin. The yeah. muffin cups. Uh, Everyone loves the muffin, man. Jewelry, uh, jewelry cases or jewelry boxes, plastic jewelry oh, containers. Okay. Yeah, for uh, for various storage, yeah. storing game components. Plano would work too. Uh, here's a here's a trick. If you have a, a game hack, if you have a painter who in you are buying for, look at lipstick trays, lipstick and eyeliner trays, the like basic makeup trays, the multi tiered, you know, three, four, five steps. They are way cheaper than buying a custom miniature um, holder like I have back there. <laughs> so that wasn't bought. Uh, we also see um, an idea of dice boxes that have um, spot on like, sorry, dice boxes that have a bin on the bottom for the dice or the various, that's something I didn't think of were um, all the various dice holders, like dice boxes, dice holders. There's the, the ones that'll hold for RPGs that'll hold the miniature and maybe your cards and your dice. There's a number of those out there. Uh, also, um, uh, he mentions uh, Easy Rollers metal dice are fantastic, but yeah. definitely need the tray because they will do table damage. 
So I, I just because Jeff Sue suggested, if you do want to see us review a number of different dice towers, you can support us at Patreon. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mage's, uh, Mage Kill is mentioning the, the always ever wonderful Laminator, uh, especially yes. for the RPG people. But board game board game lovers too, uh, yeah. there are always things that you could be laminating to make last longer. Every gamer. A uh, good one for the GM in your life is some type of notebook or campaign keeper. Uh, whether that being a blank notebook, but there are a number of now designed for RPGs. Like there, there are a ton of those. And heck, let's add to that. How about on the topic of RPGs, there are a number of great books out now that are system agnostic. Like the I'm gonna forget the names, but like the 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 Ultimate Game Master Guide and the Ultimate Character Guide. I forget the full names of those books. There's the like thousand and one NPC names. There's Eureka from Engine Publishing. All of those generic here. This is useful stuff for building worlds or GM advice like um, Robin Laws of Games Laws of Game Mastering or Play Unsafe is a book all about improv gaming. There are a number of those that are out there, and similarly, there are a number of RPG history books out there that just didn't exist years ago. But now that RPG is so much more popular. So there's, for example, of Dice and Men tells the story of early role playing and TSR and what happened there. Um, trying to think of some of the other ones that are out there. There's there's definitely a, a couple different biographies of say Gary Gygax. Yep. Uh, Jeff pointed out Meeple Source has money discs, which are a lot better option. Well, not I say better option, but cheaper option than Iron Clays. Uh, the number of sweet 3D Catan boards on Etsy have been mentioned. Uh, snack size plastic baggies as a gift yeah people's people uh people love them so uh it, you know it, it's it, it does seem like a weird one but yeah ziploc baggies right it's one of those things that no one ever maybe ever buys you know the yeah. little, little tiny ones for themselves possibly because they don't want to look like a drug dealer but you need them for games you just yeah. do uh regardless of what it makes you seem like at the yeah, yeah. store uh, Danielle was pointing out uh, artistic deck of cards, so yep. a, a themed deck of cards. That's that's a popular one for anyone who plays any of those RPGs we were talking about last week. Use a standard deck of cards. Every person I know that runs Savage Worlds has multiple decks of cards for their game of Savage Worlds, and they have multiple poker chips for Bennies, and, and they're the other, usually customized. The other thing is, if they if they if you are using uh, you know cards for RPGs, uh, maybe find a tarot side ver size version of them. That can just sort of you know be a little more fun at the table. That you, if you're if you're playing an RPG game with a standard deck, uh, standard deck of cards, poker size is great, but the tarot size just kind of sizes everything up a little bit and makes yep. it fun. And again, you can get some great designs on those as well. Another one that is useful for people, especially who play uh, traditional D and D style games, is some form of initiative tracker. Uh, there's a number of different ones out there. There was one I shared the other day that was actually just like wooden pole that you stuck them in kind of like uh, signposts onto the edge. There's the Paizo combat pad, which is what I used for years, even though I didn't run Paizo's games, but it, it has magnetic strips that are dry erase. So you just write everyone's name on them and you move them around. Um, I, for a long time, we're using above the screen screen toppers right. as we called them back in the day. And now people make those professionally. So you can get some different looking ones. All right. Well, I think that's, uh, gotten through our uh oh, yeah one, one last markers one and cards absolutely yep. if you get right on wipe off cards um or if you're getting them a laminator uh <laughs> some dry erase markers Lam to be honest work. dry erase doesn't work that great on lamination like it works but yeah. it's not it's not dry erase like compared to getting an actual dry erase board uh, that's one too get, just a dry erase board. laminator uh covers specifically for dry oh maybe erase. i wonder I, I know my laminator it's so so like right. you can get it off but it's not dry it doesn't come off easy but i wonder if it's if, if, if like if there's an actual laminator sleeve that is designed yeah maybe for that i know for years and i never did find them all i wanted was a set of flash cards that were dry erase yep like yep. and i never did actually find a set really? that you was get something them at, uh, uh scholar's choice see when i looked they didn't have any oh odd all righty all right finally if you've got a game or game night question for sean and i Head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop. 
Let's take a look at Bricks and Brutes, a castle wall building game for kids. We would like to thank Nanolocity Games for providing us with a review copy of this game. Bricks and Brutes was designed by Michael Ott. This kid's game was funded through Kickstarter in 2020 and is being self-published by Michael under the publisher name of Nanolocity Games. This wall building game is designed for two to four players age six to 13. An average game takes under half an hour, though it's fairly random, so it's hard to tell exactly how long a full game's going to take, but always under half an hour. Now, the components of Bricks and Brutes is one of the main draws of the game. But here's something a bit odd about this game that surprised me when I opened up my copy. When you get a copy of Bricks and Brutes in the mail, you don't get a box. All you get is the shipping container with the game inside it, like the components for the game inside it. Now, you'll notice that normally during reviews, we put a, uh, a, a game box sort of right here, um, yeah. and it's missing right now because there isn't a game box for this. Uh, yeah. People who drop by the show live know we often pull games out of their shipping packages after the show, but this time it turned out to be an impromptu unboxing when mm. it turned out there was no box other than what it shipped in. Yeah. As such, you're not going to find this on store shelves in its current form. Yeah, I don't think there's any plan for this to actually hit retail. You are going to be ordering directly from Nanolocity Games or not getting this game at all. So, as for that shipping box, when I did open this up, that was stuffed. Like, they, they did some, some math to get everything to fit. Um, it was stuffed with wooden blocks in two sizes, a small brick and a rectangular brick, yellow recycled plastic mason ponds, purple recycled plastic brutes, and a bunch of yellow recyc recycled plastic gold coins. Um, there was a small card holder, like one of those plastic two-piece card holders, that holds the cards for the game, as well as the rules. Now, there's not a lot of cards, there's just wall cards and reference cards. Finally, there's a larger-than-usual ten-sided die with etched symbols on each side. Under all that, I did find a cloth bag. That becomes your box for the game. Once you've unpacked it all, you just toss everything in the bag. Now, as for these components, they're all excellent quality. Um, I especially appreciate the use of recycled plastics for all the pawns and coins. Um, there's a particular brand of toys we were buying for our kids. It's that exact same material where it's like a speckly. You recognize it instantly if you've seen these recycled plastics before. I also like the uh, the fact they added happy faces to the masons. Like it's just it's a nice touch. And the brutes are frowning. I don't. Know, I got a kick out of that. And I do like the fact the die is etched. It's not silk screened or heat transferred. So there's no worry that the symbols are going to rub off on this one. Now the rules are really simple. A folded strip of paper that's two sided, short, clear, and simple enough to read just before playing the first time. As you might expect with a game designed for six to thirteen year olds, the rules aren't rocket science. No. I do find it interesting, though, that the game uses a D10, mm -hmm. as that's not something most kids will have ever seen before, perhaps, and can be a great introduction to polyhedrals. Now, for playing Brits and Brutes, you start off a game with each player taking one yellow mason uh, figure. I, I, I loathe to call them meeple, because they're not quite meeple-shaped, but they're, they're meeple. Um, four coins, one small brick, and two large bricks. You're going to get a random wall pattern card uh, is given to each player, and then the youngest player starts the game. Each turn, players are going to go through three actions in order. First, they're going to build the castle wall. For each mason they have, players can move one brick, either from their personal supply of bricks to the wall or from one part of their wall to another part of the wall. When building the wall, you're trying to match the pattern on that wall card you got at the beginning of the game or the card you currently have. Get to that in a minute. Next, you can go shopping. You spend your coins to either buy more bricks, buy a new mason, and or hire brutes. Now, when shopping, in addition to just buying bricks, there's also a little trade system where you can trade in one type of brick with a coin for a different type of brick. Last, on their turn, players are going to roll the die of fate. That's the 10-sided die, and do whatever it says on the die. Now, the die of fate has 10 sides. Most of these just give players one or more bricks and one or more of the two sizes or a number of coins or both. In addition, there are three special symbols on the dice or three special events. One is the dragon. The active player picks another player and eats one of their brutes. If that player doesn't have any brutes to defend their wall, it eats their mason. A player without a mason can't build, so they're going to have to save up five coins to replace that mason to even keep into the game. 
Next is the queen. When the queen comes up, that represents the queen changing her mind on how she wants the walls to look. Players all pass their wall cards to the right and now have a new pattern they're trying to build. The brute is the most interesting of the die faces, in my opinion. If you have any brutes, when you roll a brute, you're going to grab them and you're going to pick another player to raid. That player then takes all their brutes and both players are going to roll their pawns. So you're literally picking up the meeple, basically, and throwing them on the table. Brutes on their stomachs, face down, count for nothing because they've been knocked out. Those face up count as one point. They're still conscious. Any that land on their, like, standing up count as two because they're still standing at the end of the fight. If the attacker has more points in brutes than the target, they get to steal a brick from the other player. Play continues around the table with each player taking these three actions in order until a player completes their wall, having it match the wall card they currently have, and that player wins. So, nice and straightforward. Though I have to say, and I, I, the way that they have used and referred to the queen in this game is unnecessary and kind of troubling. Uh, there are any number of ways that they could have symbolized the need to change your wall's design, and using an outdated trope about indecisive women is is just not needed. Yeah, I, I can't disagree with you on that one. Now, when I first looked at this game, and I was asked to do a review, this is one they they pitched me. And I saw these pictures of these wooden walls with these these yellow and, and, and purple ponds standing on different spots. And it really reminded me of Crossbows and Catapults. This is a game I remember very fondly from my childhood. And I got to say, immediately upon seeing that going, oh, it looks like Crossbows and Catapults, I agreed right away to check this game out. I am sorry to say this is not a retheme of Crossbows and Catapults. Actually, it's not a dexterity game at all. While I thought you'd be trying to knock down walls, instead you're doing the opposite. You're building a wall. And while that does require dexterity to build, that's not actually part of the game. So that's similar, say, for example, to um, The Climbers, which is a, a, a much more complicated game where, yes, you're stacking things, but it's all about just trying to build the wall. And then online, there's all these pictures of these walls with workers on them. And I'm like, that has nothing to do with the game. Like, that, that's artistic. You don't actually place your workers on the walls during the game. Though I got to say, my kids did end up putting workers on the walls during the game, but that's not actually part of the game. Admittedly, giving six-year-olds cat catapults and crossbows is probably something that should be avoided in most cases anyway. Yeah, fair enough. I don't know. Just looking, I thought you were going to flick the discs at the wall. It just wasn't what I thought. So this isn't what I thought it was. So what is it? Well, it's a rather light, highly random take that game. It's dead simple to learn, easy to teach. Even my youngest daughter picked it up right away. Now, despite being rather light, there are some interesting decision points in the game, which is what I like to see in a kid's game. Deciding what to spend your gold on is, is your biggest choice in the game. It can be very interesting. Do you save up a bunch of gold to get a second mason? Because once you have two masons, you can move two bricks a turn. Well, that's great. But if you don't have the bricks, those two masons are wasted. And it's going to be hard to get the bricks if you spent all your money on, waste, on masons, for example. Uh, is it worth getting a bunch of brutes just in case you get the chance to raid another player? Or should it be the arms war and you get a bunch of brutes so no one raids you? You're probably going to want to get at least one brute because that dragon is devastating if you don't have a brute to protect your masons. In the end, though, the randomness of that 10-sided fate die is going to have a big impact on any particular player's ability to win. Now, what I do like in this, especially when played with three or more players, is to take that elements of the game do tend to prevent a runaway leader if one player starts to get a bunch of lucky rolls on the dice in a roll and gets all the money or all the bricks. And then the other two players do have a way to kind of counteract that jumping ahead. Right. And while not ideal, especially for modern hobby gamers, reducing the strategy in favor of randomness is a common theme mm. in many games aimed at younger players and can help circumvent lack of attention or yep. focus that might be needed to uh, deep, do deep strategy. And there is that hoping to roll for the thing. You definitely saw that with the kids, right? The, oh, I hope I roll money, or I hope I roll that brick I need. And the, the, the expectation of the, the anticipation of the die results is definitely part of the enjoyment of the game, especially for my kids. Now, my favorite thing about this entire game is that brute battle. Now, this is the second game I've ever seen that has you rolling your workers, right? Rolling your meeple-like dice. Uh, the first was Breakdancing Meeple, which I reviewed back in August which I thought was a really great method. Now, these aren't meeple, but they're similar. And I, everyone I played this with, uh, adults and kids, loves rolling those purple pawns, looking to see how many of their brutes are standing or not. 
Now, I got to admit, no one yet has rolled the standing brute. So I, I, I assume it's possible that if they land the right way, they can. But anytime we play, the brutes are always face down or face up. The problem with this mechanic, though, is it doesn't happen enough. Like the brute is only on one side of the 10 sided dice. So you only have a 10% chance of ever rolling that. Plus, because of that, spending all your money on brutes seems to be a bad strategy. Despite wanting a whole bunch to attack or wanting a whole bunch to defend, you're going to spend that money and it may never even come up. I personally think this game could have been improved by having a second brute symbol uh, on the die. I'd, I'd either to probably replacing one of the you just get a couple bricks uh, sections because that would both encourage players to buy more brutes as well as letting you get that do that fun thing of rolling your brutes more often. Yeah, it's always interesting how to determine the odds when building a game like this. Even uh, the fact that they went with a D10 tells us something. But if in playtesting, the Brutes weren't seen in the same light as, as the way you've seen them, and, and with that fun level you have, yeah. uh, you know, we can easily just leave them as one of the three special events to try and ensure their rarity rather than encouraging what you've seen as a fun aspect of the game. Yeah, it was the, the kids seem to be the same too. They, they seem to really dig that aspect of it. So overall, uh, Bricks and Brutes, a dead simple game. Um, for just my wife and I first played it without the kids, we thought it was great looking. It definitely has a nice table presence. It looks like you're building walls because you're building walls. You want to talk about tying in the theme? That definitely worked. I just wasn't that engaging as gamers. Now, once my kids sat down and played, that's when the game started to shine. Both my girls really enjoyed the game. They love stacking up their bricks. They like placing their pawns on the walls. Um, particular, my youngest always put their mason where they were going to put their next brick, which actually kind of gives something away if someone was going to raid her, but she can always move it somewhere else. Um, and they also love to take that element. My kids liked being competitive and rolling the dragons and picking which of their workers to eat. And of course, as siblings, they tended to pick on each other until then they decided it was time for dad to go down. And they just kept picking on me. They loved raiding the other players' camp. They loved rolling the brutes. They loved stealing bricks. They cheered when they got a good roll in the die and, well, laughed at the other players when they rolled something bad that didn't help them. Now, what this means overall, of course, is that bricks and brutes seems perfect for the market it's targeted at. It says it's for 6- to 13-year-olds. I will say no hobby gamer is going to be entertained for, by this for long. Um, maybe on a you know New Year's Eve night at 3 in the morning after some adult beverages, they may have some fun. But you know what? Kids are going to love it. Uh, I assume most people's kids are probably going to love it as much as mine. It's a simple to learn, easy to play, quick game with a great table presence due to some great components. And really, you know, the kids loving it is what matters the most. Yeah. So for a deeper look at Bricks and Brutes, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. Now a look at Not Dice from Black Oak Gaming. Thanks to Black Oak for sending us a review copy of these rather cool <laughs> dice. Not Dice was designed and published by Matthew O'Malley under his company Black Oak Games. Uh, these dice were kickstarted in 2015, but didn't hit the market until 2016. A single set of Not Dice includes a number of games and puzzles for one to four players, with the game time varying greatly by game. Now, all of the games are pretty much quick filler style games, and most, if not all, can be played in well under half an hour. The highlight of this game is, of course, the 18 Celtic Knot pattern dice, which you can see for yourself on our Knot Dice unboxing video on YouTube. So as you'll see in the video, these are nice, thick, chunky dice. Like, they're larger than your average six-sided die. You're looking at 20 millimeter square, which is about um, half an inch square. This makes the pattern on the dice easy to see and also makes the dice nice and easy to manipulate and stack. Now, every die in the set, all 18, are identical with six different knotwork patterns on them that can be combined to make larger knotwork shapes. The dice are colored to look like Connemara marble and the patterns are actually etched into the dice and inked with silver. Now, in addition to the dice, a box of that dice also contains eight wooden two-sided tokens in four colors and two books. One's a book of games that can be played with the dice, and the other is a number of puzzles that can be played with the dice. And I have to say, these books were bigger than what I expected upon seeing the game. Um, so what kind of games can you play with not dice, and, and where should someone start? 
Well, for someone new to Not Dice, I suggest grabbing the puzzles book first on your own before you got your group together to play. This book has seven different puzzle types that include creation puzzles, which give you a set of dice all set to a specific side. And then you have to take those dice and make a pattern, a complete pattern out of them. This one is great for learning how the dice fit together. And this is where I recommend you start off because it'll give you a good idea of the different sides of the dice and how they interact with each other. Then I would move on to completion puzzles. This is where you set up the dice in a pattern specified in the book and then manipulate that pattern following a set of rules. Uh, for example, being able to swap the dice in the corners or translate an entire row of dice from one side of the pattern to another. And those are the only two moves you can move, make. Later completion puzzles will add the ability to rotate some dice. You're gonna score yourself based on how many moves you take to make the completion pattern. And then try again and see if you can get a better score or compare it to letting someone else try at some point. Next are transformation puzzles. These have you set up the dice in a completed knot work pattern and then transform that to a different knot work pattern. Now these follow most of the same rules as the completion puzzles, but it allows you to flip dice to other sides, but only on the edges. Again, you're gonna score based on how many moves you make. Building puzzles have you try to complete a three-dimensional object with a single pattern on each side. So you have a cube where you're trying to get a single pattern on each of the visible sides, or there's one that's a rectangle, or you're trying to get one complete knot work pattern covering the entire stack. These so far to us were the hardest of the puzzles we tried. Now there are two more puzzle types that I will leave for people to pick, who pick up, leave for people who pick up these dice to check out on their own. All right, well, now are these all solo puzzles or can they be played with or even against others? Uh, they are designed to be solo, but what I found is many of them don't use all the dice. So like Deanna and I would both try at once to do the same puzzle. So um, there were there's a whole bunch of three by three puzzles and there's 18 dice, right? So three by three puzzles are nine dice. So D would take nine dice and I would take nine dice. And we both set the same pattern and see who could solve it first. But generally, they're made to be played solo, but there is a scoring system for all of them. So one of the things you can do is then you can have anyone play anywhere in the world and go online and say, hey, I played Completion Puzzle 6. A, what, how, how many moves did it take you? And try to beat someone else's high score. So each set of not dice also contains a game book. Uh, this game book has 12 different games. Now, each game here is quite different from the next. There are a couple that build on each other, but there's, there's a wide variety here. These all have variable player counts, many being able to be played solo as well. Now, the max player count for any of the games in, with a single box of not dice is four, but the rules include games that will go up to higher counts if you have more than one set of these dice. And for people who kickstarted it, you could have ordered extra dice and there were deluxe sets that had more dice. But for the average person shopping for retail, you're going to have to pick up two sets. Is the deluxe uh, box not available for sale? Not that I know of, but it might be on their website. I would have to go look. Because I know the deluxe set, the deluxe is, is 36 dice, not 18. Yeah, so it's it's two sets worth. So that might be available on their site. I would have to go. It's, it's okay. blackoakgames.com, I think. Well, no matter what, we will drop a link in the show notes. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but here are some of those games and a brief overview of them without getting into details. Uh, the first game of the book, first one we played is Kells, uh, based obviously on the Book of Kells, the, the, the famous manuscript with all the not work artwork. This is a cooperative game where players are working together to make a single pattern. You start off with two dice on your turn, you're gonna grab another die, you roll them, and then you're gonna to have to add one of those dice to the central pattern. If you can't add a die, it's removed from the game. If you remove too many dice from the game, you lose. If you do manage to complete the pattern, you're gonna get points awarded for the number of dice used and the size of the finished pattern. Kells the Book is a longer version of Kells, which actually we found a little more enjoyable, where you're gonna to try to make multiple patterns. At the end of each round, any dice you didn't use in the current pattern are lost, and then you start a new round with the dice you have left. And you just keep doing that with smaller and smaller pools of dice, scoring each one individually, and then adding up all your scores at the end. 
Not So Fast is a competitive real-time game where players are rolling their own set of dice, trying to be the first to complete a pattern using all of them. You start off with only four dice, and when you complete a pattern, the game stops, and the player who completed the pattern then draws another die. So now they have one more die to complete their pattern with, and you keep rolling, and when you complete another one, you take another die, and you keep doing that until all the last die is taken. Then the winner of the game is the player with the most dice. A Celtic Yarn starts with a random 3x3 grid of dice made up of only ends and chains. Players each take and roll a separate die, one that's not part of that grid, and then on their turn, they're going to add a die to the pattern by sliding it in from one edge and then taking the die that comes out the other end as their uh, die to play next. The goal here is to be the first player who can make a path going from one side of the grid, passing over four dice and coming out another side. Snakes is a push-your-luck game where players start off with a string of chains and an end cap. Each turn, you're going to roll five dice and add any chains or curves to your growing snake. Any other dice are useless. Each roll, players have to add at least one die to their snake, and if they can't, their snake has been bitten, and you lose any dice added to the snake that round. Instead, if a player passes before busting and rolling all, all bad dice, they get to move their token on top of the snake to the new head, and then their snake has moved along, and they're going to replace their spent dice from the back of the snake, from the tail. After playing six rounds, whoever's gotten their snake the furthest is going to win. And that is less than half of what yes. you get in the games manual. Then one I do want to highlight, uh, getting it I think up to half here, is there is an RPG story style game, an improv story game included, which was fascinating. I'll admit we didn't try this one. Uh, this is called Not the Whole Story. This is an improvisational story game for up to four players. The game starts with an end cap placed on the tail. On the table, sorry. Players then split the dice evenly and roll them. Players decide on a genre, setting, and basic premise and a character or two they want in their story. Then each round, players are going to add one die to the growing pattern and tell part of the story based on what side of the die they use. If you use an end cap, you're bringing that part of the story to a close. If you're using a chain, you just continue the story in a logical way from where it's gone before. Corners, though, of course, introduce a twist where you have to put a change and branches are going to introduce a fork in the story. The group as the whole wins if they manage to finish off with an end cap and bring the story to a logical conclusion. Though really in this type of game, everyone just wins by having a group experience. I have to say that is a unexpected but cool addition. Yeah, certainly not something you'd expect in a box of dice. Yeah, I totally agree. I, this one kind of like, oh, that's interesting. They threw it in here. And it's worth noting that the games were not all designed by the designer. There were multiple designers that were involved in the various different games. And this one, obviously, is not from the designer, but from someone else. And I apologize for not having the name offhand. So overall, when looking at, at Not Dice overall, um, one of the things I think is important to to for not dice is the dice, right? Like that, that is a, one of the biggest features are just the dice. Um, these dice are fantastic. They're big, chunky. They're a joy to hold. They're easy to manipulate. They've got a nice heft to them. They look fantastic. And I, I love the fact that when they launched this on Kickstarter, they sold it as an art object. And some people are considering them. They're like, this is a knickknack. This is a, these are a work of art. And I think that that's well-deserved. Um, it was my wife that pointed out that the color and style they're going for was that Connemara marble. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it totally is once I saw that. And I, I think they nailed that look. And I love the fact they're etched, so you don't have to worry about the pattern being knocked off or worn off. And I honestly think that this set of dice alone is worth the price just for the dice. As a standalone thing to own as a, as a knickknack i think just having these on your desk to fiddle with and and for people to admire or to have on an end table or a coffee table in an entertainment area or if you, you own an office having them out in the waiting area i just think would be a great use of these dice yeah i can absolutely see these uh marketed as one of those executive desk puzzles that used to be used to see at all the the sort of business stores and the fancy uh you know higher yeah. men stores uh i could totally see myself using these and playing with them while i'm stuck on a conference call yep <laughs> yeah and for for, for uh, anyone who like 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 fiddle stuff this would be great yep. i can't think of the fidget yep, Fid as, as a fidget tool yep. i think these would be great 
But this isn't just a pretty set of dice. So there's a game and some puzzles. So starting off the puzzles, I was impressed mostly by the variety. Like some of them are dead simple. You're going to breeze through them. Like the creation puzzles, like it was one of those that Deanna and I were both working through them. She had the dice. It was like, do I really need to finish this? Like you can tell. Like the first one is you have a cross and four end caps. You're like, oh, I don't know where these are going to go. Like like they're, they're a little bit simple. But you know what? They were great for getting to know the dice. And I do recommend starting off with those creation puzzles just to get used to how the dice fit together and which patterns go with each other and, and how they connect. So I, I do recommend it. And then on the other end, some of the puzzles are hard. Like, like, I don't know, the creation puzzles in particular seem to like use a part of the brain that both Deanna and I need to exercise more. And I think it's the same part for people who can solve Rubik's cubes. I have a feeling if you can solve a Rubik's cube, you're probably going to be really good at that swapping the edges and translating things. Cause Ooh, we, we had a hard time, but overall, I think this is a great variety of puzzles to keep someone occupied. Like this is a great for solo. You're stuck at home, something to play around with. And I think there's enough variety here to keep it interesting. Absolutely. I love that you've got the, uh, the learning curve there in the puzzles because you don't want to dump people in, in the deep end. And some people are more puzzle, you know, yep. oriented than others. And again, that, you know, just learning the dice and, 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 figuring out all the little things that are on them, uh, mm -hmm. especially for someone who may, may not be used to not work patterns, is, uh, is just a great tool. Now, while the puzzles are an interesting distraction, the real fun to be had, in my opinion, with Not Dice is the games. Uh, we've now tried most of them, and every single one of them is fun and engaging in some way. Some are easier and quicker than others, but there weren't any that weren't fun. Like, it was just, oh, this is a dumb game, or this is just boring. All of them were at least interesting for a few plays on, on, for each of them. Now, despite being dice games, what did impress me about these games is they weren't overly random. Like, yes, yeah, Snake, the, the, the push your luck game, yes, that's highly random. You're rolling dice hoping to get the right symbols, and the person who rolls the right symbols is going to beat the person who doesn't in general. And if you're losing, you're going to push your luck. And if you're not losing, if you're in the lead, you're probably not, right? That's how push your luck games go. But most of the other games were much more about thinking ahead and predicting what your opponents were going to do. Um, in particular, a Celtic yarn, the one I was talking about where you push in dice from the edges trying to make a pattern, had that very chess-like abstract, uh, the Duke, Onitama, that same kind of brain space I find for a two-player game. And overall, I was really impressed by the variety, uh, the number of different ways that the designer and the people who helped them could come up with to use this set of dice. Like it's, it's one pattern of, that are the same on all 18 dice. And I was even more impressed by how much of a change it was using the dice different ways. Especially, you get to your first wall pattern. I think it's called Kells the Chapel. And instead of doing manuscripts of the book, you're supposedly painting the wall. The change in mental process from worrying about the top of the die to the four sides like was surprising. Like Just that, wow, that felt different, even though really I'm still just making clockwork patterns. Right. Yeah, the effort and thought that went into this rather simple you know on the surface simple product mm. both physically and with the puzzles and games is really top notch yeah. uh, and i think it's something that people could easily miss on a shelf this is just a small box of pretty yeah. dice and it's really a tough sell because it's impossible to grasp just how much gain you get from this little box of dice yeah, I agree. There's there's nothing on the front of the box, especially to say this is a box full of 12 different games for various player counts and seven puzzle types. I don't know how many individual puzzles there are because each type had multiple ones. I didn't sit and count them up, but like I'm going to say 20, no, probably 30 or 50 different puzzles in there to play through. I it just it, you're right. It doesn't sell itself. It looks like, oh, some custom dice. And people are also, this is the other thing I guess I hadn't noted yet. There is no way to translate this pattern into a one through six. Like you're not, you, you couldn't use these as standard dice. Like I guess you could write up your own little uh, cipher between them, <laughs> but it's not like if you count the curves or anything, it, there's three curves, two curves, four curves. It's not like these, these dice are specifically designed to make not work patterns and not be used as normal dice. Overall, I, I think it shows in the review already. I, I'm impressed by this. Like, I, I am more impressed than I thought. I remember when this was on Kickstarter, and I remember thinking that's neat, but it's just a bunch of not work dice. And 
it's much more than that they are great looking dice i expected great looking dice these are as i said an art object they they could be a desktop tool there or a desktop toy like these are really cool what i wasn't expecting is the sheer number of different ways to play with these dice there are some really solid engaging games here and some great activities for doing solo that makes this set so much more than just pretty dice and they are pretty dice well for more info on not dice head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews. And now, Before... Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at games we played since the last episode. Uh, this past week, the big thing I got done was I unboxed everything from the pile of obligation. Uh, eight games in total. I uh, used the new camera for this, and I think it was a significant improvement on the overall video quality. Though we do have some tweaking I need to do with the chroma key to hopefully improve things a little bit, remove some artifacts. As usual, you'll be able to catch these unboxing videos on YouTube as they release once a week on Monday. The Not Dice video that we mentioned during the review segment is the first of these that went live on Monday, and the expansion will be up next. Yeah, for anyone checking out the podcast, they should both be up, so... Uh, the other thing I've been doing is reading the rules for these games. I uh, gotta say, Scora and Letter Jam so far have really stuck out as as better than I expected. Looks more engaging. Looks really interesting. Um, as for actual gameplays this week, it's been mostly gaming with the kids. So this included a number of games of Bricks and Brutes in preparation for today's review. Um, the kids are enjoying this more than I expected. I was especially shocked that the 13-year-old found it engaging enough. I thought she'd be like, eh, it's too random, it's too silly. Though she'd just keep knowing, she's like, I'm not sure how to play this well. And I'm like, I'm trying to point out that there, <laughs> there is some strategy to it, but when random factors are high. But when you got a kid who's used to playing Hogwarts Battle and um, the House Cup competition, throwing something like this at it, I think it's just confusing her that she expects a bigger, wider strategy than there is. Yep. But you know what? She's having fun, and that's what matters. Yep. Now, at this point, I've basically given it to them. Technically, it's behind me right now for our podcast backdrop, but I'll be handing them that game and leaving it with them. It'll be on their gaming bookshelf going forward. And what I'm looking forward to seeing is if they ever grab it off the shelf to play on their own or come to me with it saying, hey, do you want to play? That, that'll be the sheer sign that they, they like the game is if it comes back out after this. Yeah, well, I, I, it was interesting. I wasn't uh, overly impressed. Again, it's not, not aimed at me. Uh, the fact that it is hitting so well at the appropriate age bracket is telling. I say it's definitely not a game for, for gamers. Like I said, without some adult beverages, but the kids do seem to be digging it. So the other thing I did, um, I just mentioned actually, was Harry Potter's Hogwarts Battle. Uh, we reset our copy back to game one and started the campaign over. Um, the reason we're doing this this time is now my youngest is old enough to play. She's now able to read where the last time when we played this, she wasn't quite at that age yet. So um, we've been playing and Deanna's joined us for this. So we've been playing Hogwarts with the whole family. And I got to say, that's definitely been more enjoyable than just playing it two player uh, with just um, Big G and I. What I was impressed by is how well my youngest picked this one up for the strategy of it, like like totally getting the to make sure I keep my invisibility cloak and making sure I want this and I want cards that combo together. And she's the one that you should let dad grab the allies because I was playing um, Weasley who has a bonus if we play with allies. Like there's a whole thing going on there where the, she has definitely uh, picked it up. And what's weird is my oldest has gone the opposite way. And she's like, I just want to buy the snitch because I want to have the snitch and I need to save up enough to buy Dumbledore because it's Dumbledore, right? So that has been a little frustrated with her, but you know what? We're just starting off. There's a ways to go. Um, so expect to hear more on this one in the coming weeks. Yeah, my uh, my daughter did the thematic purchase thing uh, for a while, but she got out of it when the game just got hard. Uh, yeah. At a certain point, the game is just hard enough that the fun purchases just aren't that fun anymore because right. it just accelerates your downfall into uh, deceit. So yeah, I'm hoping I'm hoping she gets that at that point. We had we had a whole conversation on why what strat on game strategy with her. That there's a difference between playing a co-op and not and playing a competitive game. Is I'm like yes, but if you do this, it will help someone else. Yeah. And she did a thing where she got mad at her sister and said, "Don't buy that! Don't buy that! I want to buy it!" And then didn't buy it. We're like, okay, that's just mean. Don't do that to your sister. Yeah, yeah. So, so we've had to have a, a couple competition or conversations, stuff that did not come up when it was just two of us. Right. 
Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. Well, now that the unboxings are done, I do have a few more rule books to read. And then it's going to be getting these games to the table. Uh, the other thing I got to get to at some point is I got to get the, we've got those three Robotech games that we need to get some more plays in. Um, another thing is I do want to get to play, uh, hopefully by next Wednesday, the goal is to get the Not Dice expansion in play. That is Not Dice Squared, which as people can see in our unboxing video, which should be live now if you're listening to this at home, uh, includes three different types of dice with new sides on them. So I, I have no clue. There's, there's obviously going to be some new games. I'll be amazed if all three types fit on all six sides the way these do. I have to assume that there's going to be some patterns that don't don't match up now, but end up with some cooler overall patterns. So I do have that. So not dice squared. I, it's definitely a, a goal to play so that we can review that one next week. So that is it. Um, and that's an expansion. So I, I haven't figured out yet. I got to go through the look of the pile of obligations, see if there's another expansion. Cause I'm thinking that way we can review two expansions. Cause again, we're trying to tie things together a bit. Uh, like tonight, both games were independently published and oh, you, just need to, you just need to finish the pathfinder, uh, and then go into the second pathfinder. Yeah. Well, it's just like, <laughs> we need to finish Harry Potter Hogwarts so we can get into yeah, yeah. potions. So I, that was the goal. I, I don't know. We, we fitting that in fitting in, uh, Hogwarts is longer than I expected. We'll just put it that way. It like once, once you get up to, but once, well, you, burn, you can burn through the first four yeah. reasonably fast, but after that, not anymore. Yeah, <laughs> by by, yeah, by book five, you're not you're not gonna burn through. Like, what are you looking quickly. at for your average game time? Like two hours? Um, I th yeah, I th well, I mean, definitely now. Now that we're in the in the you know the end, yeah, the long the long ones, yeah. Unless well, unless it goes horribly wrong, and then you just it well. Just, it's well, over put quickly it and you reset and start <laughs> over. Yeah, so like two hours game with the kids is a little harder to fit in than, yeah, than no, we were thinking. And like the first one, you hammer through nice and quick, but it's like, yeah, yeah. okay, this is taking, it's taking a, a, a we'll see. <laughs> we'll see if we'll yeah. get it done by Wednesday. Yeah, because again, like book four is the first sort of full game, yeah. right? But one, two, and three are still sort of ramping up. But four is is all in, and that's your and plus, plus there's the really good chance we'll lose a few times and not just progress and unlock the next yeah, thing. Yeah, that's possible. So, yeah, so we'll see. All right. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Ah, uh, Kator, Cat, and Tori, thank you for your support. Timothy Smith, thanks, Timothy. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas. Thanks, Danielle, especially if you're still here in the chat room. And Sean P. Kelly from the excellent Gaming and BS podcast. Uh, this is one I strongly recommend. Any of our tabletop RPG fans, check out. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us at Tabletop Bellhop. You can visit our... You can visit our wow. website at tabletopbellhop.com and sign up for the Tabletop Bellhop newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. I feel like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts and our continued improvements, consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.